If you could turn with me to the Old Testament, we're going to be reading a story from Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, and um, the text is 16 to 19. I'm going to begin at 1 and 2 just to set a little context. I've been doing a, a series of messages near Landia on Elijah. This is one of them. And um, the context is King Ahab, Jezebel, Queen Jezebel. There's a famine in the land for the last three years, and it hasn't rained, and um, things are getting tense between the king and Elijah. But now they meet up again, okay? That's the context. So I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 before we uh, get to 16 and 17. 1 and 2. So after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Then our text, verse 16. So Obadiah, who was a good prophet, went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, uh, Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over the Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So thus far the reading of God's word. The day may have started out in the usual way for King Ahab as he turned to the back page of the Jerusalem Post, the sports page there where you can find the weather as well, the weather forecast, and only to read that the weather, for what felt like the millionth time in a row, read that there would be five more days of hot, humid sunshine and no rain. But later that same day, he would meet up with Elijah face to face after three long years of enduring drought and misery. So obviously, this was not your usual day for King Ahab. I can imagine that after the prophet and the king had met together in their version of the Oval Office, and after a press, press release in the newspaper the next morning, uh, the media would have said something to this effect, Troubler proposes summit at Mount Carmel to discuss solutions for climate change. Troubler proposes summit at Mount Carmel to discuss solutions for climate change. And I guess my question right off the bat here is, if I were reading the newspaper the next morning, I'd ask myself, who's the troubler? Who's the troubler? And who's doing the proposing? Uh, because it's not obvious from the headline. Is King Ahab the actual troubler, or is Elijah the troubler? And besides, whose role is it anyways to initiate this long overdue summit? Well, in my mind, this summit should have happened long before this. And again, my question is, who's responsible for calling the meeting, for calling the showdown, as what happens at Mount Carmel? Is it the role of the prophet to call the meeting, or is it the role of the king? Which office is responsible and who's guilty of negligence? Well, I like to believe that it was King Ahab's duty, the king's duty. And I believe the headlines ought to have read something like this. Troubler King Ahab proposes summit at Carmel. Now, I would like to suggest that, but that's not the way it was read. Obviously, if we were to ask either Elijah or the king, we'd get differences of opinions. When we read verses 17 and 18, we seem to get one of those he said, she said uh, moments. Uh, 
You know, no, it's not me, it's you. You did it. Uh, I didn't do it, you did it. Kind of a disagreement. Well, Ahab immediately calls Elijah the troubler of Israel, and Elijah retorts, no, you're the troubler, and you brought this upon the land. Now, is this disagreement simply a matter of perspective? A prophet's perspective as prophet and a king's perspective as king. And while it's true that partially that's what's going on here, partly because each has their own filters through which they interpret the events that have happened over the past three years. Now, in order to understand Ahab's kingly perspective, we need to do a little backtracking here, and you're just being thrown into this series of messages on Elijah. Uh, Ahab, you need to realize, tried to bring prosperity and uh, happiness to the land of Israel. Uh, he tried to get the economy humming along. He, to achieve this, he started to do trade with surrounding nations, Tyre and Sidon. He made uh, Israel part of the, the busy, if you will, global economy, the global trade that flourished at that time. And it didn't bother King Ahab that these ties with other nations also brought Baal and Baal worship to Israel along with his foreign wife, Jezebel, Queen Jezebel. It didn't bother him that his economic and his political and his military ties to the surrounding nations corrupted the worship of God in his land. That was simply the price to pay for prosperity and for happiness. He believed, and he was willing to pay the price. That was his perspective. But then comes along Elijah with his announcements, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next few years except by my word. That's the chapter 17, verse 1. There will be no rain. Well, this immediately destroyed all of Ahab's well-laid plans about prosperity. The drought devastated the land. Poverty, rather than prosperity, ruled the land. And no wonder Ahab called the prophet the troubler of Israel. As king, Ahab was committed to providing wealth for his country. That was his number one priority. That was the perspective through which he was looking at life. I don't know if that's how you look at life, but that was the king's perspective of how he was looking at life. He accepted the belief that happiness comes namely through the good things of life. And the moment Elijah said those infamous words, no rain, no bailout until Baal is out of the land, Elijah's ways and Elijah's words were troubling. How could Ahab do his job as king if Elijah's prophetic words were undermining consumer confidence? Well, even if Ahab believed that his role as king was to provide for his people, he didn't walk the talk. He didn't walk the talk. Because he didn't care a stitch for his people's plight. He was more concerned about feeding his animals, getting water to the horses and the mules, than his people. We read about that earlier in this chapter, verse 5. He was primarily wor worried about his own security and his own animals. But even still, even though he didn't walk the talk, I would dare say that Ahab, as king, was not actually acting as the king he was called to be for other reasons. You see, Ahab was king of Israel, and he was not just a king, he was a theocratic, a theocratic king. He ruled over what was essentially God's. And as such, the first thing this office involves is that the king of Israel is Israel's shepherd. He's like a shepherd to the people. And he always leads the Lord's flock in accordance with the word of the one who owns the sheep, the flock, God's word. And that was exactly what Ahab refused to do. 
It was a huge responsibility in which, in fact, it was his number one responsibility, worrying about the health, not worrying about the happiness, but worrying about the spiritual health of his people. Were they living in accordance with God's will? Was he helping them discern God's will? Things like that. You see, as shepherd king, he needed to help with spiritual discernment, with spiritual formation, with making sure that the, the false prophets were speaking, who were speaking false words, performing false miracles, were not influencing his people negatively. So, you see, there was this inherent spiritual role in his job description. Uh, recently, I was uh, listening to a podcast. You may know the name, Tucker Carlson. And he was interviewing a president from El Salvador, the president of El Salvador. I can never pronounce his name properly. Nayib Bukal, Nayib Bukal, the president of El Salvador. If you know anything about El Salvador, it is pretty well the murder capital of the world. Uh, gangs rule the streets. There's no peace in the land. And the president was elected about five years ago, and he got in a second term because he was doing such a fine job. He had an 85% approval rating from his people to continue what he was doing to clean up his country. That's an amazing uh, percentage, 85%. And uh, after he's been working there for a while, in this interview, he said to Carlson that uh, the murder rate has dropped below what apparently is the murder rate in Canada, the murder rate in the United States as well. He said in that interview that his number one concern as president of El Salvador was to seek the wisdom, to seek the wisdom, he's a Christian, to seek the wisdom from the Lord. Uh, he would say that often at their cabinet meetings, they would be getting into these very, very difficult uh, issues of trying to clean up uh, you know, gang warfare and gang violence. They would stop uh, to ask for discernment. They would stop in prayer and ask for the Lord's help because in his words, he said this was spiritual warfare. He was dealing with satanic practices on the streets and he was fighting that. I mentioned this because King Ahab should have been doing the same thing, seeking to find the Lord's will in the midst of chaos. But he wasn't. He wasn't. One day, a young seminarian was telling his seminary professor about why he felt called to the ministry. He said this, I like helping people. I like helping people. Yeah, I like helping people. Which is, if you think about it, a troubling answer, if we want to keep with the theme of troubling. It's troubling because trying to help people in an affluent, consumerist, capitalistic culture, let alone the church, becomes extremely problematic. Help for most of us, help for well-off people, whether the help comes from a young seminarian or from a shepherd, King Ahab, or whoever, uh, tends to mean providing space and means for them to fulfill all their desires, whatever those insatiable and bottomless pit of desires may be. Uh, it's a view of life that believes that the greatest tragedy is when tragedy strikes, when there's illness, uh, when there's suffering, when we're not healthy. Uh, Robert Bella, in his study of the American life some years ago, wrote a book, and he put it like this. At some point, we stopped worrying about whether we were sinful or whether it was possible to be righteous. Uh, Bella noted, at some point, we, we stopped worrying about all of that, and, and instead, uh, we sought to avoid, you know, becoming unhealthy, and it was all about health. Or as uh, someone else put it, we stopped naming our children charity, 
and we stopped naming our children Grace, and we began naming them Tiffany, and we forgot why. We forgot why. You see, the model today, whether it be for our kings or our shepherds or our doctors or our prophets, is that we believe that their number one role is to be one part king or shepherd or whatever it is, and three parts masseuse, and simply keep massaging our insatiable needs, our insatiable desires. And along comes Elijah's, the Elijah's of the world, and he reminds the Ahab's of the world that there is a different vision to live by, a different story, a different word, God's word. Ahab thought that it was all about avoiding pain, avoiding suffering. All Ahab and the people of Israel were worried about getting, was about getting help, you know. Get the turn, you know, turn the taps, turn the rain on once again, and things will be back to normal. But that's not the story by which we are called to live by. Ahab was not a masseuse. He was not a young seminarian driven by a vision of happiness that consisted of pain relief. No, he was a shepherd to his people who ought to have, right from the first appearance of Elijah, upon the scene, ought to have questioned, he ought to have questioned Elijah and his claims to be being sent from the living God. Think about that. Elijah said, he was told by the living God, that there would be no rain in the land for three years. But my question is, who's to say? Who's to say? Just because the three years of predicted drought actually did come true, that in itself is not final proof. You see, false prophets were capable of certain so-called miracles. The magicians of Egypt, remember Moses, the plagues and whatnot, you may recall that time. Uh, They were able to do amazing things as well. You see, God warned his people not to assume that a prophet had been sent by the Lord simply on the grounds that he said so, or simply on the grounds that he was able to perform some mighty miracle. Uh, Let me read you a a text that actually says that very thing. Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3. If a prophet, or one who foretells, foretells by dreams, appears among you, and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder by which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let's follow these other gods, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with your heart and with all your soul. You see, the king should have tested Elijah about whether he was a prophet. Was he from God? Was he not from God? And Ahab failed because he didn't care. He didn't care. He was, in fact, called to raise the question and seek an answer, that fundamental question of whether all of this was truly from God or not was not part of the conversation was not part of the conversation, and it needed to be. And hence, even though it wasn't Elijah's role as a prophet to take the initiative for that summit, he did so by calling the summit at Mount Carmel, and all along, he's the one that's called the troubler. He's the one that's called the troubler. Now, I want you to notice that the same thing happened to Jesus. The members of the Sanhedrin saw powerful signs and wonders coming from Jesus. They witnessed this with their very own eyes, with miracles. They heard a man who spoke with authority and with incredible wisdom, and they faced a revelation of power that went far beyond the ability of any normal human being. You know, the blind could see, the lame could walk, the sick were healed, the dead were raised through Jesus. So what did they do? Did they recognize Jesus as coming from God, a man of God? No, they proceeded to do what Ahab did to Elijah. They argued that Jesus brought trouble to his people 
and he was a threat to national wel welfare. And along this line, do you remember what was said by the chief priests and the Pharisees at a meeting of the Sanhedrin? And they raised this question, interestingly, just after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, a resurrection from the grave, it's almost like deja vu all over again. See, we didn't read it, but just before this chapter, Elijah, fresh off of a resurrection in Zarephath of that boy, the breaking in of God's kingdom, and here he's called the troubler, and so too Jesus is called the troubler. You see, in John 11, the leaders ask this, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing, performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him, and then the Romans will come after us, take away our place and our nation. Can you hear what they're saying? Jesus was wrecking their cozy little arrangement with the Romans. Jesus was a threat to their political alliances that they were making. See, the chief priests and the Pharisees were like Ahab. They stubbornly refused to consider the possibility that Jesus, like Elijah, spoke from God and came from God. And the only way they understood life was to think only in terms of peace and prosperity and security and happiness. And if you threaten that, of course you're the troublemaker. But the thing is, that's not the world we live in. We live in a world where God's kingdom is continually breaking in, where shed blood means forgiveness, where a sacrificial lamb leads to wholeness with God, where rain stops for a reason, where prophets need to be tested. Ahab, the shepherd king, should have known this. And his failure to live according to these truths and according to that reality in that world is where his troubles began, as it will, of course, for all of us if we do the same thing as King Ahab. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we are going to be troubled of heart and find ourselves in a lot of trouble if we are unable to live in the real world, a world that belongs to you, a world where you are alive and well and are here. And for us to pretend that you are not here or that you will, your will ought not be done or where we fail to see you are reconciling all things to yourself and redeeming us, would be a grave mistake, indeed a troubling mistake. It would be living against the grain of the universe. And so our prayer, Lord, is that you will help us fix our eyes on things above, on you, on your kingdom, on the real world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.